Welcome, everyone, to District Divided, a D.C. sports podcast, more specifically a Washington Commanders podcast. I am Amit. That is KDOT. And today's episode, a lot of coaching vacancies are now gone. There are only two left, Seattle and your Washington Commanders. Those are the only two teams remaining without a head coach. We're going to walk through the head coaches that were hired this past week and then talk about the Ben Johnson rumors because that's slowly turning into fire from smoke. So we're going to get into that. We are, of course, going to now talk about the NFL landscape. So now that it's beginning to form, now that these coaches are hired, what opportunity do we have to rebuild? How quickly can we rebuild? We get into the NFL landscape, the NFC versus the AFC, things like that. It's Championship Sunday. We got two great games coming up. We are going to make our picks for that and recap our 4-0 and divisional round where we just killed it, KDOT. Applause to both of us right there. Uh, comment mailbag as we always do after the pod. KDOT, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic. I'm out of the basement, as you can see. I'm in sunlight, maybe a little washed out, but hey, I'm here. And fully deserve sunlight with those 4-0 and picks. Once again, well done to you, sir. I mean, we just we just see the board clearly right Look now. Look at us. Look at us. Look at us. Look at us. Yeah. Um, and before we begin with the coaching stuff, if you enjoy the episode today, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. And by the way, we're growing a lot, so we really appreciate you guys. Subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, comment as you always do in KDOT. Share this shit. You guys are doing an amazing job. Keep it up. Let's get this momentum going, guys. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Please do. We thoroughly appreciate it, guys. It's it's nice to see the channel growing. So without further ado, why don't we go ahead and get into it? So, KDOT, in the last week since we last spoke, four hirings have occurred for head coaches. So the Titans picked up Brian Callahan. Mm-hmm. Okay. We got Dave Canales over with the Panthers now. They're pairing him with Bryce Young. And then mm-hmm. we've got Raheem Morris, your guy. Going to Atlanta, so it seems like they listened to last week's episode and get went. You know what? We should hire that guy. He's uh, right he's got a lot that Rolodex, a mm-hmm. lot of connections, paid his dues, etc. Since his first time coaching, and then of course the big news is Jim Harbaugh to the LA Chargers. I'm sure we'll get into that in after the pod, just because that's such an enormous topic. Uh, but that leaves two vacancies: so the Washington Commanders, of course, and the Seattle Seahawks. And so with those two, there are many available qualified candidates you talk about years past like bill belichick pete carroll mike vrabel those types and then you got the young up and coming guys you got ben johnson you got bobby slick now ben johnson in particular has been rumored to us very very heavily across many outlets now to the point where it'd probably be disappointing if we don't land him uh what do you make of the ben johnson rumors kdot do you believe that it is going to happen or do you still see some room for others i I think for the most part, when there's enough smoke like this, there's probably fire. But I will say that um, from what I understand and reading everything that I have and listening to guys like John Kime, who we love, he's our savior here on this podcast. The the idea is that nothing that you're hearing about what's happening with the coaching search is coming from the ownership camp out of Washington right now. So if you take that, and you understand that nobody truly knows because they're not talking to anyone. I think I mentioned the other day, uh, a few weeks ago, that they were, I was listening to a pod that, um, what's his name? The dude that we hired as consultant. Um, there's uh, Bob Myers, there's Rick Spielman. Rick Spielman. Rick Spielman does another podcast. And he was in like an undisclosed location in a hotel room, not allowed to talk where, where, he, was, where he was potting from. Like there is an element of secrecy that makes me think that, hey, you never know for sure. Right. You never quite know for sure. They're bringing in a bunch of other guys to to, to do the uh, to do in person or the meet up second time as far as the interviews go. So, like, I, I, I would say that the thing that makes the most sense as far as Ben Johnson landing here is when you look at the Adam Peters hire, he was the top candidate as far as anybody was looking at for front officer GM. And to everyone for the last two cycles, the top coaching candidate has been Ben Johnson. So if you're looking at that lining up, Washington's getting their 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 pick, top dog, and you're seeing across the rest of the league, everybody else is hiring left and right. 
because they know we're not in the Ben Johnson sweepstakes, probably behind the scenes. That to me is what screams, hey, most likely this is probably the guy that's going to get the gig. Yeah, absolutely. And they even asked Ben Johnson about it. I think Nikki did for one of uh, yeah. DC Sports Media saying, hey, what what do you know? about Adam Peters, about that front office. And he said, I've heard nothing but fantastic things about it. Certainly didn't uh, didn't do anything but pour more gasoline on those right. rumors by saying that. Now he's got a game to focus on, of course. So that would, if it were that hiring to occur, take place in the future. While the Lions are, you know, we probably need to wait for them to be eliminated. We can interview him right. after this week uh, because there's a two-week period. But... We will see what ends up happening there. I think it's probably going to happen at this point, Kid, because there's so much smoke around it. And because when you look at Bob Myers and his connection to Adam Peters, mm -hmm. and then you look at Rick Spielman, his connection to, of course, his brother, who's in Detroit. We yep. talk about Aaron Glenn. We talk about Ben Johnson. It almost seems like those two things have signaled the types of people that we wanted. So yep. I suspect it's going to happen. Now, Dan Quinn is being brought in for a third time. And some people are uh, nervous about it because I think they they do want Ben Johnson. Maybe they don't want Dan Quinn. And Dan Quinn, his last you know performance on the defensive coordinator side of things wasn't particularly great with the Dallas Cowboys against the youngest team in 50 years in the Green Bay Packers. So understand the trepidation there. My opinion on that, KDOT, bringing Dan Quinn in for a third time. One, maybe we do feel he's a strong candidate. Two, maybe putting pressure on Seattle, the remaining vacancy, to go, hey, we are seriously interested in your candidate, and they go ahead and just hire the guy. Uh, because there's been a lot of smoke around Dan Quinn, who, of course, had some success with Seattle and the Legion of Boom going yeah. back over there. Any thoughts there, K-Dot? It's the same. Re so, like, why I was so high on Raheem Morris when we were talking about last week and why and we'll get into Atlanta him. We're talking well. about stuff. Right. Is I think people need to. Um, I, I know that me and you have gone back and forth ad nauseum about how important it is to either have an offensive guy compared to a defensive guy compared to what I think the most important factors as far as a um, motivator of men, a great communicator and a dude that knows how to delegate duties and hire the right guys. Can you fill a coaching staff with the right people? If you look at like what Detroit's doing right now with Dan Campbell, Dan Quinn, if we're looking at guys that have shown a pedigree for doing this in this coaching cycle is top three. Like, if we're looking at a dude that can absolutely, if you talk to players or coaches that have worked with him, they tell you he is a culture setter. This is a dude that, so I understand the trepidation. I get it. I get that it's not the sexy thing to do. I get that when you hear somebody like Dan Quinn, you think retread. Now, he's more of a retread than I'd say Raheem Morris to a certain degree, but the the idea that, like, hey, man, we're getting a defensive mind guy. We, we, we top pick this and the other. You got to remember the most important aspect of a head coach is what he does as far as taking control of that room and motivating these guys. And Dan Quinn can do it. So I just don't want anyone. If you've heard me talk about these coaches the last few weeks, I'm not down on any of them. Really, There's not any one of these candidates where I'm like, Ugh, I don't like that. The most you heard me say anything about was like maybe Bill Belichick or Jim Harbaugh, just because I thought there might be a clash with the front office because of their prior experiences. Right. That's it. Like that's uh, it's just a fit thing. But I, I think I what I don't want people to do is get so hamstrung on one guy that you're that you're missing the positive qualities of some of these. Guys. And that's the old us. Right. Is getting hamstrung on one guy going. Yep. This is my favorite. We have said a few times on this podcast in Adam, Aww. we trust in Adam Peters, yep. we trust. Right. So if he wants a guy and their vision is aligned and that person is a clear communicator, a leader, meant the things he's looking for. Right. Trust it. That is what this now is. We now have competence in the front office and even beyond that with ownership. Yep. So it is time to put your trust in these people. So if it happens to be Dan Quinn, happens to be Dan Quinn. Personally, KDOT, I'm cool with it because I have faith in the front office. Any final thoughts before we move on to the NFL landscape? Yeah, I'm saying I, I'm, I'm, I'm living my life. You know, fake it till you make it. I am putting my trust in Anna Peters and everything because of how shit things have been so far. Jury's out on all of these guys, right? Of How's course. it going to turn out? They get the benefit of doubt. What I would say is that if I'm looking at these coaching candidates, I can look at all these guys individually, and you can too, anybody watching. 
look for the positives and look to see what people are saying instead of getting tunnel vision. That's it. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Just don't get tunnel vision. You don't have to give anybody blind faith. But I'm saying look at what guys have done historically and try your best to project what it is they might be able to do in a new situation. Like that's the most you could do. Some of these young dudes, the hottest candidates, they don't necessarily have a whole lot of experience when it comes to being uh, to, to communicating with a bunch of people right. and having to motivate an entire team or doing anything managerial. Right. So it's like just keep an open mind. Keep an open mind. Uh, and without further ado, why don't we go ahead and get into now. So this was inspired, I believe, by Earl Bruce. I believe you asked in the comment mailbag a while back, how quickly would you anticipate a rebuild? Maybe it was Tony. I apologize. Someone had asked that question. Yeah. And uh, I think we had both got, you know, maybe two, three years, something like that. It's going to take some time. There's, you know, a rookie year for the coach, for maybe the quarterback as well with pick two overall. And so maybe it takes some time. And it could. Uh, but it inspired this NFL landscape view along with the championship games. So if you look at the AFC, you've got the Chiefs and the Ravens. That's Patrick Mahomes. That's Lamar Jackson. That's big time from the quarterback perspective, right? And it's big time from the coaching perspective, Andy Reid and John Harbaugh. And then you look at the NFC side of things. It's Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant. It's Jared Goff who moved and actually was packaged with a pick to go to Detroit and you got Dan Campbell, you got Kyle Shanahan and it, it got me thinking about, okay, well, how quickly can we reload? How quickly can we rebuild? And going through this exercise is a bit quicker. Honestly, I came to the answer that, Hey, this can actually happen quickly. It mm -hmm. can. So, so KDOT, let's, let's make this a fluid conversation here. Okay. A AFC versus NFC. Do you see a difference? Let's just start there. Do I see a difference? Yeah. Okay. And what There's, differences do you see there? Um, I think the AFC, kind of like how it's been historically since probably the early 2000s, is the more quarterback-heavy GOAT sort of uh, conference, right? So, like, if we're even looking – yeah, we, <laughs> name them. Lamar, you just name them. Lamar, Pat, oh, we will. Josh, Joe, Justin. They're all in the AFC. Right. <laughs> like um the NFC has some promising up and coming guys, but nobody that you'd put on those wavelengths, right? Dak had a great season. Nobody's putting him in the same conversation as those guys. Jalen mm -hmm. Hurts had a great season two years ago. Nobody's putting him in that conversation. So though. so here's what I'm gonna do, Kate. I, so what I ended up doing is I went through the AFC coaches, the NFC coaches, uh -huh. the AFC quarterbacks, the NFC quarterbacks. Let's go ahead and begin with or I'll just run through all of them on the AFC side of things real quick. So on the East, in the AFC East, we've got the Patriots with Gerard Mayo, first time head coach yep. to be determined at quarterback. They have pick three overall. He's hinted at drafting a quarterback. You got the Jets with Robert Sala and Aaron Rodgers. Okay. Aaron Rodgers, I think you could make the case, a very strong case that he was the best quarterback in the league, best quarterback in the NFC for sure over the last few years before going to the New York Jets. Four years ago. Right. Four years ago. Okay. Uh, then you got the Bills with Sean McDermott, Josh Allen, Dolphins, Mike McDaniel, Tua, Tungabailoa, right? The North, Steelers, Mike Tomlin, Kenny Pickett. But then you get John Harbaugh, Lamar Jackson, Zach Taylor, Joe Burrow, Kevin Stefanski, Deshaun Watson. We'll see what they end up doing. I think they are still tied to him contract-wise. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the South with the Colts, Shane Steichen, Anthony Richardson, Jaguars, Doug Peterson, Trevor Lawrence, Texans, D'Amico Ryan, CJ Stroud, Titans, Brian Callahan, Will Levis, or... To be determined. We'll see. The West. The West is now loaded, KDOT. This AFC West. Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes, Jim Harbaugh, Justin Herbert with the Chargers, which we'll talk about after the pod. And then Las Vegas Raiders, Antonio Pierce, to be determined. The Broncos, Sean, Pay Sean Payton, to be determined. Okay, but the coaches. Pay some help. <laughs> the coaches are loaded. That's the AFC side of things. So you look at the top quarterbacks there. Patrick Mahomes is clearly number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is you could make the case for Lamar. You can make the case for Joe Burrow. You could, some people will make the case for Josh Allen still. I don't have him at two, but some people might. No. Uh, you look at the media, you would think that Josh Allen played better than Patrick Mahomes this past week. It's, it's kind of crazy to me, but some people believe that, which is insane. Uh, then you still got CJ Stroud. You got Aaron Rodgers, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Herbert. Mm -hmm. that's eight quarterbacks. So by definition, one of them is going to miss. I didn't mention Tua. I didn't mention, depending on how you feel about the guy, Deshaun. Right. Like There are a number of quarterbacks 
that are going to miss the playoffs. It is insane. And I would make the case you could drop any of the top five, whatever your top five is in the AFC, into the NFC. They're the best quarterback immediately. Yeah. I I can't argue that. Yeah. Okay. Then you look at the coaches. Andy Reid, John Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh now, Mike Tomlin, Doug Peterson, Sean Payton, Kevin Stefanski. Like this AFC. Dear NFL gods, thank you so much for having us in the NFC because we're about to run through that. And if we were in the AFC, I have a different answer to this question. Like, yeah, it's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. And CJ Stroud is an anomaly. D'Amico Ryans is an anomaly. But uh, short of that, I mean, it's going to take time. It is going to take time in the AFC, but we're in the NFC. And so we're going to jump into that now, KDOT. Commanders to be determined, to be determined, (laughs) right? We don't know our coach. We don't know our quarterback. Cowboys, Mike McCarthy, Dak Prescott. Giants, Dable, Daniel Jones. Eagles, Sirianni, Jalen Hurts. Packers, LaFleur, Jordan Love. Vikings, O'Connell, Kirk, maybe somebody else. Right. Lions, Dan Campbell, Jared Goff. Bears, Matt Eberflus, probably to be determined. It's looking more and more like they're going to take Caleb or a QB with pick one. Falcons, Raheem Morris, to be determined. That's an intriguing spot. We'll talk about that. The Bucks with Todd Bowles, Baker Mayfield, it looks like. Panthers, Dave Canales, Bryce Young, Saints, Dennis Allen, Derek Carr. Just just keep a mental note of the quarterbacks I'm mentioning and the coaches I'm mentioning. Seahawks, to be determined, Geno Smith. 49ers, Kyle Shanahan, Brock Purdy, Cardinals, Jonathan Gannon, Kyler Murray, Rams, Sean McVay, Matt Stafford. If -hmm. we do the same exercise, Kata, with the quarterbacks, I would go Matt Stafford one, unless you would have somebody else up there. Maybe Jared Goff, maybe Dak, maybe Jalen. Kirk, love, like, mm. but could be love. It could already be love. You could, I would entertain that possibility. More Kirk, but okay. Okay, Kirk. You throw Same. Kirk into the AFC, where does he rank? Uh, not not high. I just, okay. but I, I, my only thing, I, I just think this is kind of for the most part been the case forever. Uh, the AFC mm-hmm. to me has always been the more quarterback heavy, um, perennial guys have always been over there compared to the NFC, which is you have a strong defense and a quarterback goes on a run, right? So like even Mm -hmm. during that entire period where Tom Brady and Peyton Manning were beating each other up in the playoffs, you still had Phillip Rivers was in there. You still had Big Ben Ben Roethlisberger was there. You still had guys that were always there. There was always somebody who was having like some hot streak, whoever Buffalo might have had a quarterback at any particular point in time, but Ryan Fitzpatrick was always around doing shit in the AFC. Sure. um, and the NFC has been more of the we beat each other up with defense and um, the the road through the playoffs technically is easier because they're not dealing with some of the other quarterbacks. But even if you look at the AFC, for the most part, during those entire periods or whatever, usually you got one guy who's the dominating force. Nobody's getting past him anyway. That was Brady. And now it looks like Mahomes. It looks like it's Mahomes. <laughs> so it's like, right. it's, it's one of those things where it's like, hey, <laughs> Damn if you do, damn if you don't. <laughs> but the, and so this is where okay. So then we look at the coaches. I would okay. say Sean McVay is number one. He's won a Super Bowl. Yeah. Okay. You got Kyle Shanahan, who consistently has the 49ers running like a well-oiled machine. Right. You could make a case at three for any number of people. It could be Nick Sirianni. He's been to a Super Bowl. It could be Mike McCarthy. He's won a Super Bowl, but it was a long time ago. It mm-hmm. could be uh Dan Campbell right now and what the culture he's built over there. It could be Matt LaFleur. But relative to the AFC coaches, there's something to be had here as well, in my opinion. Yeah, no, uh, to me, the NFC has a lot of promise in certain areas, right? I think the AFC has more teams where it's like, prove to us that you're the real deal. Right. Or prove to us what... So, like, the when you were talking about the Josh Allen debate that's been happening this week, which I've just found hilarious, that we're talking more about Josh Allen than we are Lamar Jackson, even though Lamar Jackson... Insane. It's nuts, right? Insane. But then if you really want to contextualize the Josh Allen thing, which I trust me, I could go long winded if we want to do after the pot on it. But we can certainly the 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 idea to me is that, like, regardless of what he does, he's still in a conference with Patty Mahomes and it's not going to. It's your second fiddle, motherfucker. <laughs> it's not you're, even Lamar. Like we're or third this week, or fourth. And we're, we're going to get into our championship picks here. Like you're not, but the thing is that like, if you look across the AFC, it's a bunch of guys that everyone thinks is good. And yet get to a Super Bowl. You know what I mean? So it's like the, the, the jury's out. So it's something like how to the NFC to me just screams of like exciting promise or unfulfilled or 
you have teams that you're not sure what's happening with the quarterback thing. Exactly. It, just, it feels very much in flux. Like, is Green Bay continue to be good? Will Minnesota, what are they going to do at quarterback next year? Because they got a they got a pretty damn good offense, right? Like, um, so so we've looked at the NFC and we've looked at the AFC and we have determined, hey, from an NFC standpoint, unfulfilled per- potential, some promise, but but a lot of unknowns it's in unknown, the NFC. Right. Unknowns. You look at our division. And it is consistently, what's the one consistent part of it? It's a new division winner every single year. Yep. Right? So you're going through this uh, revolving door of who's winning this thing. You go through this, uh, I was looking at new hires, you know, for coaches. Kevin O'Connell in his very first year wins a division, goes to the playoffs. Then you've got, uh, and sorry, I need to refer back. Of course, Matt LaFleur, he has Aaron Rodgers. So you could maybe say, okay, I don't know. Todd Bowles has Tom Brady. I don't know, but that's part of it. Like, you know, that is part of it. First time head coaches or year one head coaches rather going immediately. McVay did the same thing. Like there is room to be able to be good in the NFC almost immediately, right? That is possible, especially in our division. So now let's look at us. We have the most cap space. We have now there are only two vacancies. So we have our pick of coach basically. Okay, let's say Ben Johnson goes to Seattle, just as an example, that still leaves you Vrabel, that still leaves you Belichick, that still leaves you Slowick, that still leaves you like any number of perfectly good candidates, it still leaves you. And that's the quote unquote worst case for a lot of Commanders fans, right? Is if Ben Johnson went to Seattle or stayed in Detroit, there is still room to be able to be very, very good. And then you get to pick your quarterback, right? It could be Kirk. I don't necessarily want that, as you know, but it could be. And immediately, I think you're entered into a conversation, a very interesting conversation, right? Uh, If you hit on your quarterback and you do have an offensive-minded guy, and if you look at the track record, skate out, we could dive into that next episode. You can hit the ground running on offense very, very quickly. So then all of a sudden, you could have a potent offense. You're one. It's possible. Okay, so all I'm doing is arguing for the possibility that this rebuild happens quicker than you think, and it's okay to be excited about it. Will it? Jury's out, like KDOT said. But I'd rather be in the NFC, and it wouldn't surprise me, KDOT. Here's a bit of a wild card. The Dallas Cowboys are imploding right now. They were, there, they were the first two seed to lose to a seven seed, right? Youngest team in 50 years in the Green Bay Packers. You got family members coming out saying, Dak ain't it. You got a half-hearted Mike McCarthy's our guy type thing. The Eagles, we still don't know what's going on over there. And Brian Dable apparently is so insufferable that Wink Martindale just quit. So we could be in a situation where, let's say, we did get Ben Johnson or whoever the coach is, could be the longest tenured person after the end of next season as coach. Yeah. That is possible. So all of a sudden, year two, we're the team that is year two into a new culture and everybody else is resetting potentially. I just want to point out what the landscape looks like and that there is possibility here. You talked about unfulfilled promise and potential. We are the team in the NFC, short of the Falcons. We'll talk about Raheem Morris, but we are the team in the NFC that has that kid. Somebody told me a stat the other day. I, I didn't confirm it, and I'm going to probably fuck it up right now. Uh, probably shouldn't say it. So the, uh, but um, from my, from We're not professional. I, Go ahead. Do it. Well, I'm thinking about it because I'm trying to verify in my head if this is true without Googling it. And they told me that um, since like 2022, 2021, 2022, all but like one team in the NFL has changed offensive coordinators yes. and play callers. Yes, you're right. That That is correct. That is, okay. That is correct. This league's in flux. <laughs> okay. It's, the whole fucking league's in flux. Um. Th- I mean, to me, it speaks to uh, some deeper core issues as far as um, my whole thing when it comes to the tying of the quarterback to the mm-hmm. office coordinator head coach. I think it's a, I think there's a deep flaw with that philosophy, sure. especially when it comes to the short time frames that people are expecting things to happen. I think the combination of those things together lead to a lot of flame out and failure. Uh, I think there's a there's a pressure that exists. If you're if the coach comes in, he drafts a guy, the guy's not good. Do you yes, give that him risk enough exists. leeway yeah. to get another guy? And, and we agree that we would want our guy to sit 
we're we're a bit more traditional that way, where we want him to be able to take the time to learn the offense, get used to NFL life, sort of like Jordan Love has, sort of like Aaron Rodgers got to. It doesn't have to be three years long, but Mahomes got a year basically. Like, Lamar which is, sat, which is why, like, and we'll talk about it more because we got time. We do. Is why if if you got a Ben Johnson to me, a Ben Johnson, Kirk Cousins plus the top three quarterback to me would be mm. my perfection. But okay. I also know that when people hear that, they're like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're going to pay for a quarterback. You're going to draft a quarterback. How much are you going to put in the quarterback position? What are you doing? And to me, it's that I don't like that people get so caught up in the way that everybody else is doing shit. <laughs> like, I, just do it. Just do what you think is best. To do. And to your point, the way yeah. everybody else is doing shit is not offering Lamar Jackson. Now the league MVP will be the league MVP, presumed. Yep. A contract. It would have cost two first round picks. If you're Atlanta, you're absolutely kicking yourselves right now, right? Because I just mentioned all the QBs on the NFC side of things. Lamar is immediately the best one, and you're immediately dominating that division. You don't get Bijan this year. That's what that would mean. But other than that, you still have, they had a top 10 defense statistically, right? You have Drake London, you have Kyle Pitts. You got a weak division. This this was a weak division in this NFC South, which is why Raheem Morris being there and Zach Robinson, you'd mentioned this, KDOT. Again, the Falcons listen to that. It looks like he is going to end up being the OC over there. They could dominate immediately. Like Just speaking to the South. NFC, speaking to the NFC, they could come in and immediately the Falcons have been a trendy pick for you for some time. Now there's real reason for it. I, but, all right. I said all that I said. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to take it somewhere else i said what i said i get what you're doing okay i understand what, I what you're doing this is content for the pod and it's good content, two, it's good content. uh Here and number help. two it, it it feeds into our impulses of looking around the league and saying oh my god it could happen for us i don't want to have the conversation like <laughs> me it's like i'm saying i don't like the way that things are being done in the league right now as far as the way that expectations are set, mm -hmm. the variables at which exist that set unrealistic expectations, how in how subconsciously they might be. The conversation alone leads to an expectation. You, I'm a cinephile, right? You I know what? Dal movies. Dal Dallas falls for this all the time. Right. To your point. Right. So, like, I I watch movies all the time. I watch movies all the time. You know, I'm a huge cinephile. You're a movie snob. You love it. I'm a movie. I'm not going to say snob. All right, fine. I'm a snob. Whatever. But the idea is the, one of the worst things that you can do sometimes when going to a movie is if you set an expectation of what you're going to do or see when you watch the movie, it influences everything. So, like, if I sit down with a, with an expectation, if I go into a movie and everybody's telling me, hey, this is Oscar, this is going to be nominated as best movie, best movie of the year, you got to look at this performance and this and that. When you sit down in the theater and I got mm -hmm. my popcorn and watch the fucking flick. I'm now searching for the reasons that people tell me that this is an Oscar worthy movie. I'm not just watching the movie. I'm, hey, I don't know about that acting gig. I don't know if she did that. I'm not feeling stuff. And if you're thinking about the fact that you're feeling stuff, mm -hmm. you've already failed at it. <laughs> it's done, right? So, so, like, so to me, it's just let's ride it out. <laughs> and we're going to. We don't know who the coach is. We don't know who the quarterback is. There's still plenty of unknowns. Free agency needs to happen. The draft needs right to now, happen. This, all right, we're, we're, what date is today? It is uh, January 26th. 2024. I give you by week four. If these motherfuckers are only three, <laughs> the comment In this section, NFC, we'll still be in it. <laughs> but here's, in this comment section, and because of what you said right there, there's going to be a deflation when you guys is so massive that me, I'm sitting here like, hey guys, you know, it's a new coach and you know, a new sister. Like, yeah, the lame did it. That's not <laughs> Ray Morrison at Atlanta. They're four and oh, mother. I, I need to be clear. I need to be 100% clear. I'm not saying it will happen. I'm saying that there's opportunity for it. I'm saying don't entertain the thought. That's all. Just... I can't even entertain the thought. Don't in it. I'm saying it's insidious. It, it's. You save this for our August episode when we see the free age class and, the, and we when we make a stupid fucking prediction. When we say that this team's gonna be ten and six based on the schedule release, <laughs> like that's, that's yeah, what which we say. did by the way for those new ones. We both picked the Commanders to playoffs at nine and eight. That didn't go well. 
Right. But the thing is, after like week two or three, we kind of let go. We did. <laughs> we did. Right? So it's like, you need something to be super ridiculous. What you're trying to do right now, which is what makes it so evil, what? is that you're subconsciously setting unrealistic expectations under the guise that you're being uh, calm about it. Logical. That you're being logical and you're being reasonable about it. No, you're not. You're not being reasonable. Okay, Dot, I'd make a great politician. Why don't we go ahead and uh, get to our <laughs> championship picks where we got two great sure, games. Really, Nikki Haley needs to hire you. Like, she, like, <laughs> That'd be the better fucking Indian in the room. Uh, why don't we go ahead and, yeah, again, two great championship games coming up for you guys. We got the Chiefs and the Ravens in what I think has the potential, speaking of it, to be game of the year, right? You've got... The Kansas City Chiefs, who have the history and the pedigree in the playoffs, and you've got this Ravens team that statistically have been dominant. Lamar, after getting the bag, has been showing out, presumed MVP. Very, very exciting spot for the NFL and for fans. So very excited for that game. And then you got Detroit and San Francisco, where Detroit, talk about one of the best stories of the year, right? They hadn't hosted a playoff game. They hadn't won a playoff game. In decades. And then there they are in the NFC championship game, mm-hmm. with biting kneecaps with a culture, with an attitude, with excitement. And then the San Francisco 49ers, that well-oiled machine, ran into a couple little cogs last week. But Brock Purdy, in a big moment, leads them on a game-winning drive. Does that spur them on? Right. Are there still questions? Have they answered all of them? Debo may not play. There's a lot of intrigue over there. So, K-Dot, which game do you want to pick first? Uh, let, let's go NFC. Let's go NFC. Okay, so once again, that's going to be the Detroit Lions at the San Francisco 49ers. It's officially slated for a 630 kickoff. It is dependent on, like, let's say Chiefs-Ravens goes to overtime. They will delay right. that kickoff just a little bit. So, But as of right now, 630 p.m., Fox, it's going to be a great game. K-Dot. What do you got? And the line, I believe, is seven, seven on the dot, maybe seven and a half in favor of the 49ers. I haven't checked it out because uh, my betting apps have just been basically a delete money button. Oh, for right. Basketball. Yep. A lot of people are familiar with that. Weeks. Jesus Christ, basketball is but a goddamn bloodbath. Um, That's why we talk about football. Fucking assholes. Uh, all right. So, yeah, my last opportunity to make some money this weekend. All there right. So the. I'm going San Francisco. Now, my confidence index on San Francisco is very dependent on Debo Samuel um, and his ability to play, even his ability just to line up, right? Um, One would think if you give Kyle Shanahan enough time to plan over the course of this week, the Detroit defense, as much as they do have some good guys that will put together some good moments here and there, they're just not – they're not the upper echelon as far as from a defensive perspective. You should be able to put some points up on them. Um, I, this feels like it's going to be a heavy Christian McCaffrey game to me. Um, mm-hmm. like if this is going to be Christian lined up in all sort of different ways, all kinds of different things. I just think that there is an element the same way that like we talk about, like the Buffalo Bills getting to a point where it's like, hey, can we do this? Like we always get to a point like, can we do this? I think the same thing can be said about San Francisco to a certain degree, especially when these injuries and stuff start popping up. There is an element of like every fucking year they get around this time and something happens that gets them out of this and it gets in your head. And if there's a team right now that you look at that doesn't give a fuck, that just plays hard. House money, the the definition of it right now. It's Detroit. Like the, the way the day Campbell got these guys flying around the field, there is no denying that they don't give a shit. They don't care about any sort of history. They don't care about any. These guys got them. He he has them playing like this. The last this this the last season of their lives, right? Mm-hmm. So there is a anything can happen sort of thing. When you get into that nitty gritty, does San Francisco let those ghosts kind of pop back up, especially with Debo not being there? And then knowing the course of these games and seeing what's happened, surely somebody's probably going to get hurt during this game and have to come out for a series or two. What does that do? So I'm super excited for this game. You have this is a story in Detroit that's 30 something years in the making. And you have a San Francisco team that everyone's crowned every fucking year is clearly the most talented, probably the best. And they get over the hump. Excellent question, man. 
it's just I, I look at just from a pure sta- talent standpoint, I think San Francisco is more talented, and that's the only reason I'm picking. And you know, I think you hit the nail on the head. Can they get over the hump? It's a question that was asked to Dallas. The answer is no. Right. And and it's real. That history that it, it produces tension for some people. Mm-hmm. Now that's why I think seeing Brock Purdy overcome that tension. Being as polarizing a figure as he is, which is crazy to me. It's ridiculous. It's honestly ridiculous. He was the last pick in the draft. He's a second-year starter. He's leading the NFL in a number of categories, and all people want to do is say, but his weapons. I mean, he is, he's been fantastic. He's greatly exceeded expectations, but people just want to chop him down for whatever reason. Well, let me just say this. That San sure. Francisco is not helping that either. The story that just got released this week that they were looking to add Tom Brady this season. Yeah, and that's that's on them as an organization. Right. 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 And so we, we talk about organizational excellence. Kyle Shanahan has them as a well-oiled machine on the field. Off the field, you can ask questions about them. He's a bit of a loose cannon. That. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Stop. And he is a loose cannon. He even talked about prepping for Green Bay in the second quarter. It was a little jab at the Cowboys. It was fun, but also yes. like he, there were stories here about Kyle being incredibly immature. He's an asshole. Right. So I think he'll so admit that. he's an asshole. He knows exactly. So even that little smirk, he knows he is. Anyway, he knows. So here's the thing: the quarterback advantage is with Detroit. Yep. Jared Goff's been to a Super Bowl. Dan Campbell has these guys believing, and it is an incredible, incredible feel-good story. The thing that worries me about Detroit is that this year they were good against the run. And for whatever reason, last week, Rashad White was doing whatever he wanted, running the ball for Tampa. Tampa cannot run. And all of a sudden, they could. And the game got unnecessarily close. Todd Bowles didn't call timeout and try and force a kick. I mean, which was crazy in and of itself, because that puts Badgley in a very, very tricky spot. Uh, I'm going with San Francisco. I think Debo does suit up. And they could even use him in motion as a jet sweep decoy. Even if he's not well enough to touch the ball, I think he suits up and is at least used in motion so that they have to think about it. McCaffrey, I expect to feast. And I expect Brock, the last couple of games, the Detroit Lions have given up over 300 yards passing to everybody. Looking at the weather, there are no elements to overcome. It favors both QBs. But especially Brock, I think, especially after the week he had last week where it was a bit rough and then all of a sudden he overcame it. Give me the San Francisco 49ers, but I can't wait. I wouldn't be surprised if Detroit ends up winning, but give me San Francisco. And now we go over to the AFC K dot mm-hmm. where we have, again, the juggernauts, the Kansas City Chiefs going to M&T Bank Stadium, local for us, you know, against the Baltimore Ravens, the one seed of Baltimore Ravens, 3 p.m. kickoff CBS. It's going to be electric i cannot wait for this game this is the game i'm most excited for i'm very excited for detroit yeah. san francisco but man this one that's Ooh. why we're saving this one we save that's this why, one for that's why we save this one for last k dot what do you have in this one and the, I and have... the half is oh sorry 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 the yeah, spread yeah. real quick for betters because we we have some of those three and a half i'm leaning to four with mark andrews playing mm-hmm. He's go back. ahead um, so as someone who's going to be driving back home to Baltimore around tomorrow afternoon, I'm a loser because I'm going to be stuck in that fucking traffic. Um, it's going to suck so bad. I got to probably get tomorrow the Saturday the north. Oh, sorry. Damn, it's Sunday. Sunday is when oh, okay. I'm okay. Yeah. But I, I don't know why I thought today's Saturday. Um, so because you're right. just having fun. You know, I'm dreading the traffic so much. I'm just delirious. So or like that. the, <laughs> oh, Taylor Swift's going to be in town. And the memes of her and him and her in Baltimore have just been hilarious to me. All right. So this, yeah, it all comes down to this, man. Like the, the, the idea, I think for most people is that probably the winner of this game is probably going to win the Super Bowl. Um, the, the, the Ravens have been great this year. And I think the matchup that everybody's looking forward to is, Mike McDonald versus Mahomes and Reed. What happens there? Everybody knows how high I am on Mike McDonald. Everybody's seen what Mike McDonald has done over the course of this season against anybody that claims to have the next big thing on offense, right? Name whatever offense you want to in that acclaimed AFC that we keep talking about. He hasn't given a shit. I'm going to beat you. And that's what he's done. Um, 
Then you have Lamar. And he's getting Andrews back. And Isaiah likely looks good. And they got one of the best rushing attacks in the league. And they got Lamar, who doesn't go down. He doesn't get sacked. Doesn't really make mistakes either, right? So, like, to me, it lines up really, really good. Baltimore to get a victory. But I don't pick against Mahomes. And I ain't doing it this time either. Patrick is a god. He's a god. There is a – everyone wanted to talk this week about Josh Allen. There's a chasm, guys, between whoever your number two guy is and the guy who is Patrick Mahomes. He doesn't deserve to be compared to anybody anymore. His comparisons are one Thomas Brady because it actually looks like he might catch that motherfucker, which seemed like an impossibility, right? So, like, the idea is I refuse to pick against the God. I refuse to pick against football's Michael Jordan. I won't do it. And my guy, who you know, I screamed into a microphone last week in Isaiah Pacheco. If you look at the stats, the Ravens defense usually is not giving up a whole bunch of rushing yards to anybody. But I also think it's because most people got to throw when you get to a certain standpoint of Baltimore just ahead by a lot. Sure. If you break down Mike McDonald's defense, which I've done ad nauseum because I wanted to hear him as coach, there are opportunities to do it if you stick with it and you keep the score manageable you can run you can run on them if you need to give me a huge isaiah pacheco day and give me my homes making plays when he needs to make them give me the chiefs okay so you got the chiefs and this is you know it's one of those games baltimore statistically Best defense, they lead the NFL in sacks and takeaways. I think in points per game, something like that. Everything spectacular. Lamar, unbelievable year mm-hmm. where he has taken a level up. He's taken a step up in terms of throwing the ball. Even the harshest critics who were calling him a running back saying he can't do it. They finally gave him some weapons, right? In Zay Flowers. In Odell Beckham, Isaiah Likely's emergence, then Mark Andrews coming back. Everything lines up for Baltimore. And sometimes you just got to throw the numbers right out the window because there is, like you said, a God on the other side of the field. And this is not one of those times where you throw those numbers out. Because Lamar, to me, has a chip on his shoulder Mm -hmm. where no one wanted him this offseason except for the Ravens quietly quietly and make that clear as well he also one of the one of the most intriguing things about lamar jackson i'm taking baltimore uh, and i by the way think this could be a two-score game like i do think that they could actually beat kansas city badly i don't agree with you okay because lamar there was something he said after the 49ers road game where they won 33 19 And he talked about the media and everyone had anointed them against San Francisco or rather San Francisco against them. They were like, oh, it's the 49ers, 49ers. He said, you know, we're a bunch of guys that need to feed our families, too. And the way he said that, and he's like, I didn't appreciate the disrespect. The way he said that was like, okay, there there is a demon here. There is a guy that he can also transcend the numbers and he already is putting up the numbers. His defense is already putting up the numbers. Lamar, I think, enters the conversation of best QB in his own way with his own dynamic skill set. And I think we set up for Mahomes, Lamar moving forward. Baltimore, and it could be by two, three scores. I'm so serious about that. When Kansas City went against a very good defense in the Jets, Mahomes threw two picks. There's a guy named Kyle Hamilton. I know you've heard of him. I've heard of him. We both really wanted him here. He's going to be on Kelsey. Can Mahomes make enough plays without Kelsey? Because I think Kyle can erase him. And then Pacheco, yeah, he could be great, but he's he's got a toe injury. Joe Tooney is likely out, first team all pro. And Roquan is healthy. Patrick Queen is healthy. So go ahead, hit him. Pacheco said he wants to. Be my guest. I think they're going to fuck him up. I don't think Pacheco has a big game. And Baltimore. City's going nuts. They were my Super Bowl pick. Lamar was my MVP pick. I got to I got to continue riding the train. That's Fair where enough. I'm at. I will say this. Um, on a personal level, I think I've told you, maybe I haven't said it on this podcast, but 
I am rooting for Baltimore. Hard. Yeah, a lot um, of people are. Yeah, multitude of reasons. Number one, uh, Baltimore is safer when the Ravens are winning. I will continuously say that. Um, I live there, and I don't like crime. So the uh, I, I love that aspect of it. I heard Pat McAfee talk about this the other day, and it's been something that I I've known because I've gone to I've gone to a couple Ravens games, and um, it is the most underrated crowd in the NFL. This is a blue collar city that has had football for a very long time. They had a little chasm, they had a gap between the Colts leaving and the Ravens popping up. But this is a town that loves their team. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the way that when I was a kid, Washington was when it was like when the Redskins were here. When it was like the Cowboys week, you could feel it on the radio. You could hear the songs. Everybody was feeling the vibe. The flags were on the cars. Like you felt it. Baltimore feels like that when it comes to that Ravens team. It's not the bumper stickers are all over. The guys have the you see the jerseys everywhere you go. You're in the store, you're doing everything. That crowd's gonna be into it. And you're right, Lamar's got a chip on his shoulder, and everything you're lining up with the numbers, everything will tell you the Ravens should win this game. Um I'm so excited for this. One. It's I'm gonna so be excited. fun. It is going I'm to be so excited. Yeah, I, I think this is the most exciting game. It, it maybe years, honestly. I'm thinking yeah. back to other ones because an AFC championship game in Baltimore, Lamar chip on his shoulder, Pat Mahomes going for greatness is already great, but like going for a dynastic run here without like proper wet. Oh, Kelsey looks a step slower, but played great when he needs to. Mm-hmm. Rushy Rice, phenomenal rookie wide receiver. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen when he goes against this Ravens defense? There's a lot of intrigue, a lot of chess pieces. I love Mike McDonald. It's going to be fun to watch. And the thing that was most fascinating to me, KDOT, looking at the various teams they've played, Baltimore has played, obviously, really good teams. When they played the Bengals, they played Joe Burrow twice. When Kansas City played, it was Jake Browning. And it was mm-hmm. close. In fact, the Bengals went up. My only concern with the Ravens would be a slow start like they had last week. If they do and they keep it close, they could tighten up again. But that's my only concern. Yeah, I, no, think, I, think, I think the are Ravens the are going to be things. fantastic. They've gone against better defenses. They've played better offenses. I, I think the Chiefs are not quite the Chiefs. They happen to have a spectacular game last week. To do it again, I don't see it. No, you can't let Mahomes have the ball with four minutes left in the fourth quarter, and he can put the team up. This The Ravens have to come out with high energy from the get-go and beat them shit out of them. I, I'm literally not even going to go to a bar for this one. I, I may for the second game, but for this one, I just want to take it all in and si- like just enjoy it. Every yeah, little here. moment, the replays, all of it. I'm Without snacks, further ado, drinks, ooh, all of it. Let's go to the comment mailbag, uh, where we have quite a few comments. And thanks again. And our two of our last three videos, over a thousand views. We thoroughly appreciate it, guys. Love it, guys. Uh, but we appreciate the comments even more. So why don't we go ahead and get into those? I'm going to first begin with... One from not our very last video, but one prior to that. And it's uh, my generic name, also known as former co-host of the show, Matthew Regan, who writes, in reference to Adam Peters, pretty surprising hire, to be honest. Thought it would be KDOT after hearing his takes here. And he's got a Michigan, you know, hands emoji, celebration emoji, line emoji, eyes emoji, who Matt is having probably the best football year that anyone's ever had. You're the only reason it makes it hard for me to root for the Lions. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. There, There is a part of me that all oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Any final thoughts? That's it. <laughs> They're America's team. You make it hard. And here's the thing. The rest of the world, they if they saw what we saw in you, it'd be a lot harder for them to root for you guys, too. You'd have a lot more Brock Purdy lovers. And then we go over to the last video where we go to Landis Grant. Shout out, Landis. Appreciate it. Uh, I read that Bill Belichick is from Annapolis area. So the commander's head coach would be right up his alley. Uh, Most certainly would be. And again, he is available. And there are only two jobs left, Seattle, Washington. So if we were to just narrow it down to Ben Johnson or Bill Belichick, you're guaranteed the opportunity at one of them, which is incredible. Yeah, his dad was a Navy. He started Navy. Uh, the if I'm Mike Vrabel or Bill Belichick at this particular point in time, I'm sitting. I'm not taking any more interviews, and I'm sitting out the rest of this offseason. And the reason being, there are three teams right now that if they became available, would be the top position, top spot to be. 
Philadelphia, Dallas, and Buffalo. Yep. One of those three teams, at least one of those three teams, is going to be firing their coach. In the next and, year. And we mentioned this. And we mentioned yeah. this. So, right, exactly. If I'm Bill, now I'm standing pat. And just waiting for one of those to open up, and I'll take it. It is that simple. We go over to Blood Clot. Shout out, Blood Clot. I think the safe pick this Sunday, this is in reference to last week, is the Chiefs. No one wants to bet against Mahomes. And put me down for the Bills, but put me down for the Bills coming out on top. So he made the mistake of betting against Mahomes. I have made the mistake of betting against Mahomes. We will see if I'm also wrong. What follows is Andy Reid retiring and he'd be possibly going back to Kansas City as a head coach. So there are some rumors, KDOT, that Andy Reid could retire. Like, let's say they let's say they win the Super Bowl. Uh, there were some loose rumors about him retiring. Do you see Andy Reid retiring? Possibly. I think that's why you, there's a part of that where you're seeing in them state farm commercials and stuff to kind of build up the personality Andy Reid. Reed. Andy Reid. Yes, right. You Which are. is to me is like he can easily transition to TV and do great. Um, And I could totally see that man is he's a man of my own heart. He loves Hawaiian shirts and cheeseburgers. There are no two greater things in America than Hawaiian shirts and cheeseburgers. I love that guy. And I, I, I hate him in Philly. Can I say that? Or at least I always kind of liked him, but hated him when he was in Philadelphia. But um, I can totally see him walking away. Um, he's getting up there. And at the end of the day, nobody's going to question his legacy anymore right. and what he was able to do. So, yeah, go on yeah. and do something else. But I no, don't know no. if I, Eric Bieniemy is getting there, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very curious situation there in Kansas City. I anticipate he will continue, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, we got Woodchip Engineer. Shout out Woodchip Engineer. If they another Belichick comment. If they hired Bill Belichick as team president, I wouldn't care who they picked as head coach. And so now that brings up an interesting point, which is that so we have Adam Peters as general manager. Okay. So there was talk that there was going to be a president of football operations and a general manager and a head coach. I don't know where that stands now. I think it is almost just Adam Peters yeah, I think is. That's over. Everything. Yeah, I would agree with that. But uh, at least there, Adam Peters is the top rung on football ops is what it seems like. Yes, now. that's that is. And that was the impression we got listening to the press conference. We have a video on that as well, sure. where we break that down. Um, go ahead to Jess Anto. Shout out Jess Anto. I always enjoy the comments here. The funny thing about the Philly collapse is how much it reminds of how Washington fell apart. Philly lost both of their coordinators last year, and it really showed. Bienemy and Johnson are mirror images of each other. Both had exceptional backs in Swift and Robinson, which were criminally underutilized. Terry was dejected most of the season, but played through it with class, while Brown became frustrated to the point where he was blowing up on the sidelines. The defenses both had highly regarded defensive lines that didn't play up to par. The secondaries on both teams looked completely lost and confused the entire season. The good news is Washington has a huge jump start on the offseason with a lot more draft capital and flexibility with cap and coaching staff, whereas Philly does not. I'm getting evil genius vibes off Josh Harrison. I love it. I enjoyed that comment. Appreciate you, Jess. What'd you think, Vic Kata? I enjoyed the comment. Yeah, there are some things that rung true as far as similarities go. But... The defense is for sure, actually. Defensive line that didn't play up to par and the secondary that looked lost. I think both those things are absolutely true. I just think that there are similarities you can look across the league and kind of say, oh, that happened for that team and that team and that team. For it to be two NFC East teams is intriguing. Well, I just think that comparing Washington to Philadelphia is crazy to me, just Mm -hmm. considering one team was in a Super Bowl and they lost in the they lost in the playoffs. Another team is picking second overall. And wasn't in the playoffs. <laughs> it's like they're... both teams underachieved. You could also make that case. I mean, it, it all depends on your perspective. Both teams are teams. <laughs> like, Just half what? full or half empty. It's actually mostly full. Um, we go over. I see. I don't think. I think that's like if you had two water bottles, right? And you said all right, and they were both half filled. Like, is it half filled or half empty? One had water, and the other one had cyanide. No, I wouldn't say that. I would say I have one water bottle of one size and one of a much, much larger size. That one technically has more water. That's your expectations, right, is the size of the water bottle. And so you did like better. That. Thank you. Like and so you end up doing better, but maybe you have more room in that extra water bottle. And That's so, fair. You know? That's fair. I'm honestly proud of myself for that one. Uh, we you should be. Good. Thank you. Uh, we go over to, oh, man. See, here's the thing where I read the ats. I don't always get it right. So apologies. 
Fritz Jadot 6426. Shout out. Change your username, but so they're not giving EB a chance to interview. And so finally enough, and that is something we actually should have mentioned, is that Eric Bianami did after the episode and after this comment, in fact, it did come out that he did interview with uh, Adam Peters, with the front office, and with the team. So I think that was more of a due diligence. Give him the opportunity. He was associate head coach over here, offensive coordinator over here. I don't see him getting the job, KDOT, but he did interview. Look, I know that there's been a groundswell of people that feel as though Eric Bieniemy was kind of done dirty, um, or they feel bad for him. I feel bad for him. There isn't. Uh, we saw all the years he was in Kansas City that he deserved an opportunity. He didn't get one. Yes. One opens up. He comes to Washington. He takes the job. It doesn't end up well. And the thought process that he then goes to the bottom rung as far as NFL head coaching feels uniquely unfair. Yes. And I think there is some there are grounds for that. But I remind you of a couple things. Number one, he accepted the job. Number two, he accepted the job with the qualifiers and he wasn't bringing his own people with him. This comes down to sometimes you just have to say no. You look at Raheem Morris, 13 years since his last head coaching opportunity. He did everything he could do to build up the resume to get back to this spot. Should he have had to wait this long? No. There are, there are certain things in the NFL that are just fucked up and wrong. Right. But I'll tell you right now, he's in a position right now to succeed on a level comparable to the greats that are in the NFL. And it took the patience to get to that point to not have to say yes to everything. I, I, Eric's just got, he. it was a bad spot to pick. I, I want to piggyback off of that. And it, it actually perfect segue to a couple comments on Raheem Morris. So we'll, we'll get into that. But we talk about the NFL landscape. We talk about the AFC versus the NFC. And you look at the NFC South. And if I could just read those again, KDOT, real quick. We've got the Bucks with Todd Bowles and Baker Mayfield. We've got the Saints with Dennis Allen and Derek Carr. And we've got the Panthers with Dave Canales and Bryce Young. That's his competition in the NFC South. Okay. Raheem Morris lands there, gets to pick his QB, right? They were close to a playoff spot in a weak division with Desmond Ritter and Taylor Heineke. And mm-hmm. I love Taylor Heineke, but ultimately, obviously, isn't it. And Desmond Ritter certainly isn't it. They've talked about Justin Fields going over there. There's a case for her cousins to go over there. Mm-hmm. And they've already got a good defense and a lot of talent. So you talk about saying yes to the correct opportunities. It's almost a life lesson, if you will. The, the contrast between Eric Bianami and Raheem Morris here, where you say yes to the correct opportunities or you position yourself accordingly. Right. Much higher chance for success. Now, Raheem still needs to coach games there. That's yet to happen. It could go badly. Right. But what you can't argue is the opportunity he's given himself and the opportunity he's landed. It is a golden one. 100%. It is an absolutely golden one. And that was me being as kind as I can about it. The other part of it, as far as the EB thing is, you installed an offense. You had carte blanche on and You treated Sam Howell that way. And you installed the game plan that you installed. It's a lot of it's on you that it did not fucking work out and you don't look like a bunch of guys. We talked about Sam Howell's confidence looking absolutely shattered at the end of it, right? We had a guy that at one point, didn't Jonathan Allen say we have a guy for the next five, 10 years, Mm -hmm. about halfway through the season where he looks really good. Mm -hmm. And then there were abundantly clear moments where it was like, hey, we need to protect him. That was from day one. Mm -hmm. But then even more so when he starts making a couple of mistakes, like, hey, maybe we should hand it off a little bit more just to give him a little bit of a breather. Didn't. No adjustment. Here we are, pick two overall, talk about QBs. That's right. the reality. That is right. the reality. That interview, it would have been tough for it to go really well. Yeah. Uh, so comment number one, Earl Bruce. Raheem Morris is the ideal head coach for the commanders. He has one of the deepest role indexes in the league. He's coached both sides of the ball. He's on the Shanahan and McCoy trees as well, or McVay trees as well as others. He's a well-respected players coach. When he was Tampa's head coach, he was in his early 30s, but he's learned from his mistakes. He can put together a staff in a heartbeat. Check him out that's earl bruce and then there's one more which is from ryan lynn 3138 shout out ryan lynn as well shout out earl bruce if raheem morris is the next head coach who would you pick for his oc and dc k dot you'd mentioned zach robinson and dc who would you have uh i had a list of names i'm not going to try to pull them up right now but there's a the, the thing was is that i i wouldn't even care to name them 
to anyone. Um, it, my thing was is that when you had a dude that had that many connections, you have position coaches that maybe you don't even know or we don't even know that can get elevated. I'll tell you right now, because this kind of works for what's potentially going to happen, with Ben Johnson looking like he's going to take the role, I, there is one defensive coordinator candidate that I would put at the highest rung of this regardless, and that's uh, uh, Wink Martindale. Mm -hmm. um, this is a dude that everybody in New York was afraid that he was going to take the Philadelphia defense coordinator job, the one that Ron Rivera interviewed for, the one that Vic Fangio now has. He hates Brian Dable, <laughs> and he's a hell of a defensive coordinator. And if you have a head coach with not a lot of experience being a head coach or managing guys and not any experience on defense, sometimes it's really good to have a veteran that you can just say, take care of this side of the ball. Yes, Absolutely. And then we go over to, da, 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 I believe we've, okay, we've covered all those. I'm going back and forth just based on the flow of the conversation. Yeah. Um, let's go here. This is a quick one. Shout out, Vindo. Looking Vindo. forward to this off season. Glad we are moving forward towards the right direction. Really does feel like the right direction with competence in the front office, perceived competence in the front office. We'll see what ends up happening. Uh, but it is nice to go in that direction. Then we go over to at Mr. 921 Kevin. I'm going to assume your name is Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Shout out, Kevin. I just found this channel and you spent your whole life in the district? Then you should have started the music with some Go-Go. How about some Chuck Brown? Some Rare Essential? Lil Benny? The Masters are some trouble. Kevin. Did oh. you or did he say Rare Essential? He did. Or or sorry, sorry, Rare Essence. I, I, I went too quickly there. Rare Essence. He did. All right, just just making sure. I mean, that's a knock against you. <laughs> it's it's rare, e it, rare essence, right? You said yeah, it's that. rare essence. It's rare. Yeah. I read it too quickly. Please. All right, I, I don't want to agree with this dude because I, I ain't trying. DJ Pauly Polo is a DC guy. Who, who we that's the reason we got this on here. I love Go Go. There's also copyright issues, bud. So like, there's uh, we can't just use a Chuck Brown song unless you got some money in the Chuck Brown estate. That's like, hey, you can have it. We can't just use a backyard band song or a rare essence song without getting the entire channel potentially shut down. So there's that angle to it. Um, if you can put a go go remix to a DJ Pauly Polo song, we we'd be all ears. I'm just saying that like we gotta watch out. But Ahmed, you take an L for saying rare essential, bro. I, I was I was reading <laughs> through it too quickly. There was a lot of caps. And that is on me. I apologize to all viewers out there and all listeners out there. It is rare essence. Uh, however, I'm always going to back my guy, Polly Polo, Damn who right. is a DC legend, one of the hottest in the game. And speaking of, he comments, shout out Polly Polo. Polly. Maybe his first comment on the channel. I want us to bring Jay Gruden back. This is in reference to the Jay Gruden RG3 stuff. Also, can you please drop your Twitter handle in the description going forward? Thank you. Yes, we most certainly can. And I'll even say it here. It is at District Divided on Twitter, on X, whatever you want to call it. Polly Polo, we love you, man. Thank you for the intro music with the district. Um, and then we go over to Dennis. These are the last comments here. We go Bobby Slowick or Ben Johnson can't go wrong. But Jaden Daniels is the guy. 40 touchdowns, four interceptions, 1,100 rushing yards with 10 rushing touchdowns. Also in the SEC. Easy pick. Don't go back to North Carolina. Been there. Some would say Sam was better than Drake May. Yep. That's what Dennis says. And then a couple more. Age, in reference to Bobby Slowick being young. John Harbaugh was 37 starting at Baltimore. Not bad. To which he then corrects himself. My bad. John was in his 40s. Sorry, but he probably would have been great in his 30s along with Jim, his brother, which is going to segue into Jim Harbaugh and the LA Chargers in a quick after the pod over here. Thank you for the comments there, Dennis. This was District Divided, a DC sports podcast, more specifically a Washington Commanders podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode where we went through the head coaching vacancies, the NFL landscape. How quickly can we rebuild? I am Amit. That is KDOT. If you enjoyed the episode, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell as you always do, and comment as you always do. KDOT, what else do we need to do? Share this shit. Share it. Share it. Share it. Share it. Share this shit. This shit. Really appreciate you guys. After the pod begins right now. Rare essence. You don't know who they are, do you? Nope. Yeah. Rare essence.
Sorry, what you want to talk about, about Harbaugh? No, I'm, we're not doing this. Are okay. we? <laughs> you want to talk about Harbaugh or Josh Allen? Let's go Harbaugh first, just because okay. of the comment. Uh, what do you, what do you see the ceiling being for the Chargers now? Multiple Super Bowls. I am in total agreement. I, I am love in total Harbaugh. Agreement. Yeah, it's an A plus higher. Um, Justin Herbert's a dude. Uh, they have colossally underperformed for the amount of talent that they have on that team. The only significant issue, and once again, it is a significant issue, is that talent's going, some of that talent's about to get ousted because their salary cap situation is horrific. But here, um, here's the thing, KDOT, because people look at that and they go, oh, but the cap space, I don't give two fucks. If you've got an elite quarterback, you've got an elite head coach, more specifically the head coach, and you've got, even if you don't think Justin Herbert's elite, a very, very good QB that can make those throws, mm -hmm. the roster will shape itself, even with the cap space. These days, there have been so many issues, so many times where we've said, oh, the cap, the cap, and then somehow a team continues to get it done. They can find ways around it, or they can take a year and be able to draft guys. I'm very excited for the LA Chargers and their fan base. I think it's a little different. I think that the, and I understand what you're saying. And it, once again, I, I I said the ceiling is multiple Super Bowls. So yeah. I still like that's the and I still like the situation. That's the ceiling, right? The floor I still be. think I, the floor to me is there going to be a multi, multi playoff going deep into the playoffs because you like believe I, in Harbaugh. I yeah. believe in Harbaugh and I believe in Herbert. Everybody, I'm high on Herbert. I'm high on Harbaugh. Um, but I, I would say the salary cap thing, their particular situation is nasty. It's one thing to be a team like if you're the LA Rams, right? Which you put yourself into salary cap hell. Or mm -hmm. the Saints, where you put yourself in the salary cap hell with the same organization, the same crew. They know what they're doing. They know we're going to put money here that we're going to oust because it's okay. This guy's going to be an aging talent, but we'll get what we need at this point. You plan for it. To me, you have a Chargers team that never got even close to where they were supposed to be with that roster and the money that they spent for it. And now it's, can we even put something on the field from a salary, like there is there there is a legitimate reason to think Joey Bosa and Derwin James might not be on this team. There's a legitimate reason to think Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler will not be on this team. There's a case to be made that none of them will be on this team. It'll be a team with Justin Herbert itself. Their salary cap situation is particularly dire. You know what's interesting about that is I think when we talk about the defensive side, those players versus the offensive side, despite mm -hmm. the fact that the <laughs> despite the fact that the defensive side of the ball has been terrible statistically yeah i think it is much more important to keep those guys i anticipate harbaugh will find a way to keep both at the very least one i think keenan and austin very expendable at this point i think he believes in the qb and he will find people that will mesh with the qb and yeah. i think he's very confident in his ability to do so i think on the defensive side he's going to try and keep those current stars and continue to build that side and go, I've got a badass a QB. We'll be fine on that front. Don't worry about that front. It's the defense I'm focused on building up with the character that he instills in those people. I think there's a part of that. I think that if you look at like the wide receiver position uh, more recently and how quick these guys are coming into being stars in the NFL, there is a chance that, and once like you even talked about in the pod earlier, as far as the turnaround times being quicker for a lot of these teams, there's absolutely a case to be made for that. I would just say if you look at majority of the teams that are having the quick turnarounds, you look at their salary cap situation, they're usually alongside where we're at currently, which is that they have not spent a lot on their rosters. So like, True. or they've been in a situation where they jettisoned everyone before they're in this situation for the rebuild. You look at like the Houston Texans. There was no one of note on that team before it is that they started this rebuild thing. They jettisoned Deshaun Watson. They jettisoned um, De uh, DeAndre Hopkins. There's nobody there. You right. could like if you put a gun to most people's heads and you tell them to name five players in the Houston Texans roster before this season. I think there'd be a lot of dead people. Yeah, uh, you look at them now. I mean, and, and that's also the power of a good QB. Once you do, like Nico, right. Coll who was Nico Collins before this year? Right, right. So now all of a sudden. He's a guy. Dalton Schultz goes over there. You knew about him from the Dallas days, but he's like, one of the, yeah, he'd won the he name. Play well. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, that's one of your names. Exactly. Um, why do we go ahead? And because we agree there, Josh Allen. Yep. It's been very intriguing because so at the end of last week, which I thought was a great game, 
Chiefs it Bills. It was very fun to watch. Very good back and forth. Uh, but then watching, you know, because I think one of the things we like to do is take in sports media, figure out what people are thinking, what the narratives are, stuff like that. And the the amount of um, I don't want to say cock sucking, but the amount of <laughs> I mean, come on, like the amount of plaudits that Josh Allen received for his game, and I thought he played well. I did okay, but the amount of plaudits he received, especially especially relative to Pat's performance, Patrick's performance was insane to me. Patrick was near perfect and only had the ball for 22 minutes. And whenever he did, you talk about being a God, he was incredible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely incredible. On the other side, I said, Josh had a good game. Here's why, because they protected themselves so much. The bills did with James cook running. A whole lot. A lot of the throws are behind the line of scrimmage. And when Josh, he had the throw to Khalil Shakir, when he had to make a throw, for the most part, he did. The throw to Stefan Diggs, gorgeous. He didn't get caught, but nice throw. But ultimately, and this is where I think people struggle, KDOT, good to great, or great to excellent, etc. Those are large differences. And I think Josh is very, very good. But to, we throw great around... Too much. And I might might have even said it on autopilot when talking about him just now. He's very, very good. But ultimately, when he needed to take one step to the side or step up in the pocket to be able to hit maybe with Shakir again, I don't remember. Or make that play on third and nine. Mahomes makes that every single time. Josh didn't. Go ahead. Josh Allen does not deserve to be in the same conversation as Pat Lamar, to a certain degree, even Herbert. Um, like or Burrow. Or Burrow. Burrow went to his place and beat him too. Right. So like you, you, like, I, I wanted to hug you when you were saying was one aspect of this thing, um, which is that the difference between Allen and Mahomes was clear in that game in the sense of Buffalo had to protect themselves and Josh from himself. The entire game plan was we can't put it in his hands to win this for us. We can't. Like that's they're doing everything they can do to prevent him from ruining it. And as much as you can have the nice throw here or the nice throw there that's not catch or whatever, nobody remembers that shit. Like when everybody was talking about with Patrick Mahomes all the way through this season, they don't have any wide receivers. Who's gonna get the ball? They drop the ball all the goddamn time. Didn't fucking matter when it came down to what it came down. And to, they made the right? same excuse for Buffalo. They were like, Oh, if he only had weapons, it was like, dude, what he have you been saying the whole year? Stephon about Diggs. Mahomes. You, right. Get, get the fuck out of here. He doesn't have weapons, I agree. Right? It's a double standard. But then the uh, no, it's the, it's not the double standard. It's with Josh Allen specifically. There be, seems to be a desire to jump through hoops to make excuses for him, and it's ridiculous. I agree. Lamar Jackson should have been the guy that we were talking about this week in comparison to Patrick Mahomes instead of this Josh Allen shit. The Josh Allen aspect of it is. What I remember from this game is why'd you take the shot through the middle of the end zone when Stefan Diggs was open to get you 15 to 20 yards on the crossing route? That's what I saw. So like the, what I saw was that even in the opportunities where you could take the shot down the field, you most typically made the wrong choice because you're still trying to play hero ball. And at the end of the day, when your average passing uh, is at with 5.5 yards, <laughs> that just means... Dude, you're not in the same league as these other guys, man. Right. What you, what, what basically, what they did was what Kyle Shanahan used to do with Jimmy G in San Francisco with Josh Allen, who I keep getting told is the second coming of Christ. Like, these are supposed to be. Honestly. Like, oh, my God, look at his body. Look at, look at how he runs the ball. Look at how he does this, that, and the other. The best comp I heard to Josh Allen, it's a compliment. I don't think Josh is a bad quarterback. I think he's really, really good. Yeah. I, but I do think he needs a kick in his ass. In the sense that, like, the closest I see is, like, Dante called Pepper this more mistake prone. Like, that's the, like, get him out. Don't, st I want to hear that they're the new Manning Brady. That's bullshit. Well, the, the cross, the cross sport uh, comparison is Russell Westbrook, which I actually think is very good. <laughs> it is. In, in yeah. that you see an athlete that is explosive, mm -hmm. that excites you, their highlights are unreal, and he's going to take his threes. So he's he's going to take his shots, which you just live with or you learn to minimize. So that is, I think, a very good comparison. 
to me, it's because just, it, it speaks it's, to a deeper yeah. overvaluing of the quarterback position, which I know I've talked about. Is the so when I'm seeing it done right, I want to give true kudos to it. It's the same reason that like you hear me get so critic, I get so critic critical heavy about like Aaron Rodgers, right? You like me and you, mm-hmm. we've all you've heard me talk. And case in point, you see what Jordan loves doing this year with the same fucking wide receivers, and it's like. This is what you get when no, you're even younger. This is some of those guys weren't even there. You see what I'm saying? But this is what you get yeah. when you have a dude that's willing to work with and learn with and develop with certain guys, right? Like there yes. are certain elements outside of just can you throw the ball far? Like there Correct. are tons of guys who can throw the ball far. Like, what are you doing with it? Like Brett Favre is awesome. But you know what? I remember more. There's there's one positive memory I remember about Brett Favre, and it's the game after his dad passed away, the Monday night game. I'll never mm-hmm. forget that. It's the Raiders, yeah. But what I remember most is cross the body Minnesota Vikings to end the season, Brett Against Favre. The Saints. Like, yep. that's what I see. I remember Brett Favre in Atlanta Falcons uniform being happy that he threw a pick six when he runs off the field talking to Jerry Glanfield because the idiot just wants to play football and he doesn't understand the good or bad in it. Like, can I, that's what I'm saying. Can I can I entertain you in a case that CJ Stroud should be ahead of Josh Allen already? I listen. I mean, I here's the thing, you don't even gotta sell me on it. it. It's damning. That's the point, right? Is that you can make that case. <laughs> you don't even have to sell me on it. And I don't need to sell you on it because yeah. CJ is able to throw it deep. You think about that first shot to Nico Collins and what ended up being a de facto playoff game right. again, and ended up winning the division against the Colts. But then CJ turned it over fewer than anybody else. Like, that's the thing. So, like, they can trust him. Right. He can make the spectacular plays, and he won't turn it over. Yep. That's what you're looking for. And so with Josh, who continues to lead the league in turnovers over and over and over again, I get tired of people saying that he's this spectacular quarterback, who, by the way, is an MVP finalist, which is also insane to me. Because they just see the wow plays. It's it's very much uh, maybe something that you were um, you were hinting at me doing with the NFL landscape, which is building up the expectations and going, look at just this side. Don't worry about the other side. Just look at the possibilities. That mm-hmm. is what people do with Josh Allen all the time. Some people were saying the throw to Trent Sherfield was perfect, where Trent had to lay out, and it was ultimately incomplete. That is not a perfect throw. The ball to Stefan Diggs was not perfect. Like, the, like everybody talked about how great a throw. Yeah, he threw the ball really, really far. There was a better throw to be made to Stefan Diggs. And I get it. Stefan should have caught that ball because he's Stefan Diggs. Right. But there could have been a better throw there. And even with all this said, I don't want anybody to think that I hate Josh Allen. I still think that if Patrick Mahomes doesn't exist. I don't hate Josh Allen. I hate the media around Josh right. Allen. That's what I hate. And the, the extremes. I will say yeah. that if Patrick Mahomes doesn't exist, Allen probably has a Super Bowl by now. He probably has one. Yeah, but Joe has two or three. Like, that's the point. So there, there's already another guy I trust more. It's just the comp is close to Dak Prescott, the Patrick Mahomes. And everybody and if needs Lamar, to. Here's the other thing. If Lamar wins, then Lamar's been to a Super Bowl. Joe's been to a Super Bowl. Mahomes, of course, is Mahomes. And then we've already said that I don't need to sell you on CJ over Josh. So they changed the overtime rules in the playoffs to help the Bills and Josh Allen. He still didn't get there. Yeah. So, I mean, and it's it's a tough AFC East. And, they're, and it's the, it's the whole, McDermott. it's McDermott, it's all of them. Because the thing is that I think the Allen, I think almost 90%, 99% of all the issues with Allen are just metal. And yes. it's what are you doing? No one's to get questioning through? the physical. I, right. I think that's sort of it. Like, you know, they see the frame, they see the throws, they see the running. Yes, he is spectacular, but his mindset and that we talked about it even with Carson. He's got a lot of the physical traits, right? Carson mm-hmm. Wentz. But when it came to mindset, he just didn't have it, right. whatever it was post injury. And I, I will be fair to Carson there because before the injury, he was having an MVP season, he was not turning the ball over. He took Philadelphia as far as he could before he got hurt. And then Nick Foles did it from there. But you got to give Carson his flowers pre-injury. He at least has the injury he can point to. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Josh points to. Other than looking at, he talks about looking in the mirror all the time. They're turning into plat. Like, I don't know if platitude is the correct term, but like if you say it over and over again, it does lose its meaning. And if the turnovers continue to, the fumble, no one talks about the fumble. I don't know how Buffalo recovered that. Dalton Kincaid made the, the amount play of the game. 
the amount of things that had to go their way. Right. They were like, Josh was perfect. It was like, well, hang on. That fumble should not have been recovered by Buffalo. They, no. they were looking like a team of destiny for a moment. That's what it the looked like. The touchback fumble. Like, there's so many things that yeah, went their there. way. Like, it shouldn't have even been that And they still close. lost. <laughs> and they want to blame Tyler Bass. Which, by the way, if he hits it, it's a tie game. It's not go-ahead. It's a tie game. A minute 40, two timeouts. Patrick Mahomes, what's he done all game? Torch you. So what do you That's think a happens? a field goal to win it. It's anyway, going to happen. So we're going to have a lot. Any, any final thoughts before we take off here? Nah, I'm good. I think we're on the same page. Hey, what an episode. What an episode. Great. Appreciate you, Kate. Enjoy Championship Sunday, everybody. Thank you guys for listening. We will see you next Friday, 2 p.m. as always. Until then, take it easy. Peace. In D.C., we're just hoping that you listen. 